Hello, this is Jim Schaefer, executive producer and host of Rip Rap, the academic book television program. In response to a number of requests, we will share three interviews on writing with Rebecca Seip, Randy Bulmer, and Kathleen Yancey. Welcome to Rip Rap. Here are those conversations on these authors' respective books. Hello, this is Jim Schaefer, executive producer and host of Rip Rap the academic book television program. My guest today is Kathleen Blake Yancey, and we'll discuss two of her books, Reflection in the Writing Classroom and Teaching Literature as Reflective Practice. Welcome to Rip Rap, Kathleen. Well, thank you. Nice to be here. I have to admit right from the beginning that I really love your scholarship and the central concept of using reflection as the organizing principle in the way you teach writing and reading, and I'd like to have you talk about some about that. I think I might think about it chronologically. Um, uh, reflection is something that I started thinking about explicitly. I think it's something I was interested in for a long time, but it became a topic of interest to me explicitly in the context of portfolios. Um, and I really have to credit um, a TA with whom I worked at Purdue named Cindy Irwin, who raised the question about how we would understand students' texts if we asked them to comment on those texts. So uh, that opened <laughs> a door I think I'm still trying to walk through. Um, and so that would be one way that I would think about it. And that prompted me um, to think about reflection connected to writing specifically. But not just writing as a practice, although that's certainly part of it, uh, with specific attention to revision often, but also reflection as a vehicle for understanding um, and a vehicle for enhancing concepts and a vehicle for making connections. I am absolutely persuaded that if we invite students to make more reflections, that they learn more, they learn more quickly, and by learning here, I do mean something that sticks. Um, I think we all read out of our own experience, and to a certain extent, I'm reading out of my own in making this observation. But I had seen this in students in many different contexts and many different grade levels. So a lot of my interest in reflection um, was focused on the writing classroom. It's also the case, however, that from my point of view, writing is the flip side of reading. And what was true for writing, in my view, had to be true for reading as well. And for me, a literature class is a class about reading. So the question is then, um, what role might reflection play in helping people read? Um, and if we found that it, um, in fact, could make a difference, um, what are the vehicles we would use? Um, how will we know it would make a difference? And also, and also um, I think reading like writing, from my point of view, has the same um, hoped for outcome. And that outcome is that people will voluntarily choose to write and to read. And reflection is a way of helping people develop those practices those habits of mind that will enable them to do this um, forever. That's, so it's an ambitious goal. <laughs> but <laughs> it's, it's, it's one that has been um, interesting and intriguing and has um, helped me learn a lot, too. So. Well, and I find it a very rich topic because it also, and you talk about this in your books, it helps bridge gaps between where people are and then right. where they want to be. Right. I actually have enormous um, confidence, and I talked about this a little bit in, the, in my talk this morning. I have enormous confidence in people's tacit knowledge about themselves and about their own practices and about their own questions. I think as a general matter, we in the school environment don't tap that tacit knowledge, and reflection is one way to do that. I think the other point I would make is that when I talk about reflection, I'm thinking not just of what happens in school. I'm really trying to link my observations about reflection, um, not so much to academic theorists. Uh, Donald Schoen would be one. John Dewey would be another. There are a lot of people who do wonderful work in this area. But I'm really looking at some sort of common sense applications of these same principles that take place outside of school. And a, a good example here um, is a medical practitioner who wants to help you, who knows a lot about medical practice, a lot about how the body functions. 
and doesn't know a thing about how your body functions. You're the one who knows whether the pain that you're experiencing is in your big toe or in your shoulder. And um, the kind of doctor you might want to see might be very different depending on your answers uh, to that question. And, and without your guiding the medical practitioner, um, you're not going to have the improvement that you seek. The same principle operates inside a classroom. Without students guiding us, we're not going to be able to help them as we might. So another um, way of thinking about this from my point of view is to say, where else do we look for this approach um, to learning, and I think falling to life, outside the school uh, context, and can we make connections to those? I think that that enhances what we do, and it, it creates a, a much bigger robust, and a more robust picture. Well, and in the conference today, you were talking about what is your story. Yeah. And you have to figure <laughs> out what that is, and that takes some real work. It does, and I actually, I'm, um, I'm reading a book right now uh, called, I think it's either Organizational Storytelling or Storytelling in Organizations, and it's for authors, and the, the lead author is John Seeley Brown. And, um, you know, in some ways, um, what I'm reading in this book is not anything new. Um, people who do reading and writing do story. They know a lot about story. Frankly, people who do visual culture know a lot about story. Filmmakers know a lot about story, and one of the authors of this book is a filmmaker. The people who created petroglyphs know something about story. I mean, there, there's, there are a lot of people who have a purchase on story. Uh, what's interesting in this um, book, I'm just about to finish, actually, um, is the way the authors link storytelling, um, um, community, um, and community of practice in particular, and reflection. They see those terms uh, circulating within a context. And that's interesting to me, because their argument is that any story that you create exists within a certain community of practice. Um, that it's through reflection that you're able to create a story. And that the power of story um, isn't only your ability to tell history, what's happened in the past. It's the ability to forecast um, who you might want to become or what project you want to undertake. And, and um, another way to think about it is to say, um, when I'm working with um, student teachers, for instance, um, especially pre-service folks, uh, one of the questions I often ask them to do is to imagine themselves as the teacher they want to be in 10 years. That's creating the story. Um, that, and, I, and I don't, that's not the first question. That is a culminating question that comes after a set of reflective activities. And those reflective activities prepare you to create that story that, that finally then, if I can mix my metaphors completely now, uh, that story creates a kind of touchstone. And that touchstone allows you to return um, at periodic intervals and take up the question about, am I going in the right direction? Is this still the story that I want to guide my life? Um, or do I need to make some correction here, either in terms of my own progress or in terms of rewriting the story? So it has that kind of benefit, certainly professionally. And I'm really interested in that right now. I'm looking at medical practitioners and looking at teachers and looking at how the stories they create actually um, guide who and what they become. But I think it's true for us as human beings as well. Hello, this is Jim Schaefer, the executive producer and host of Rip Rap, the academic book television program. My guest today is Randy Bomer, co-author of the book, For a Better World, Reading and Writing for Social Action. Welcome to Rip Rap, Randy. Thanks, good to be here. This is a wonderful book, um, but I was intrigued right from the beginning at the dedications dedicated to every educator who spends part of her teaching day turned against the current. What caused you and Catherine, your co-author, to uh, use that? A lot of teachers, especially if they want to work on, uh, if they want to allow the kids to become participants in democracy, if they really want to educate for citizenship, a lot of teachers feel like they're taking a tremendous risk. Uh, it feels like um, uh, they, they're, uh, they, they, they may get in trouble or, they, or somebody may question what they're doing um, uh, just because the, some of what the topics that the kids might take might be uh, things that might be controversial among uh, some families or in 
uh, or in some neighborhoods. And so, the um, so the, the the willingness to really educate for the purpose of making a better democracy or making a better world is a little bit risky, and it's especially risky <clears throat> in the current environment where testing is driving so much of the curriculum. You know, the, the consequences of tests where a school can be shamed for years as a result of its test scores not rising at a, at, at a uh, required rate, or, um, or, or the consequences for individual principals who might be fired or moved um, as a result of, uh, of their test scores not going up. They make a really fearful environment in a lot of the schools. And so it feels a lot of times like if teachers are going to do stuff that matters in the world outside of school, something outside the narrow curriculum that gets tested by tests, uh, they're, they're taking a risk. And so it's, you, you have to love people and, uh, and support people who would want to do that with their lives. Well, and as you pointed out, I mean, as president of the National Council of Teachers of English, you're in a, position, a particular position to take a look at this concept of no child left behind and standardized testing as ways of um, causing literacy to happen. Yeah, um, the National Council of Teachers of English has for at least 30 years uh, taken positions that testing, though it's an important part of understanding what's going on with kids and whether they're learning and whether they're able to do things suddenly on demand uh, when we ask them to, it isn't really enough uh, for a teacher to know uh, what a kid is learning or what a kid can do. And it also has a tendency of narrowing the curriculum. And this is especially true in English, which is an art as much as it is a skill. Um, uh, it's especially true in English that testing tends to uh, constrain and narrow what people will pay attention to. Um, it keeps them from treating uh, works of art as art sometimes. It keeps them from treating important topics as being related to the world today. Um, and it, 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 t it tends to turn everything into little tiny atomic skills uh, that every person is supposed to be able to get from a teacher and then put back out on a test day. And that's not the way real people really are, and it's not the way learning really happens. And so, um, so, the, so it's true that NCTE, the National Council of Teachers of English, has had a tradition of questioning that, uh, that form of assessment, um, even though we, we recognize that the public wants to know, uh, are our kids learning and how well are the schools doing? You and Catherine discuss an approach in your book for a better world, reading and writing for social action, about the teaching of reading and writing that embodies certain characteristics like process and workshop and community. And I thought maybe we could talk a little bit about those. Yeah, um, a writing workshop um, is a place, or in the case of a writing workshop, it also can be it could be a reading workshop. But a workshop classroom is a place where kids come, students come uh, uh, every day. And they know what they're working on. They have work that's theirs. Uh, they know that they're pursuing particular intellectual projects as readers. Uh, there are authors they're concerned about or issues they're concerned about. And from, from one day to the next, they're pursuing that project. The days connect through the kids' intentions. Um, in a writing workshop, kids take up projects that may take them a long time to work on, that uh, actually demand something of them as writers, that are ambitious, serious projects with ser for, for readers. Um, and uh, so those. Um, uh, the, the, that environment is one in which uh, kids are making a lot of decisions. And in order to support those decisions, the teacher, the teacher does a tremendous amount of teaching about skills, about conventions of language, uh, but also about how do you do things? How do you figure out if you have an idea? How do, you fig how do you get all the pieces of an idea out so that you can put them together into a draft? If your draft isn't saying what you want it to say, how do you, uh, how do you start to figure out which part to work on first, and how do you, how, what's the process that you can go through in order to grow a draft from an early draft to a, to a finished draft. And because kids are making so many decisions, and in a way taking some risks, um, the, uh, there needs to be a sense of community in that place. It needs to feel like a safe place for kids. Learners learn when they feel safe, when they feel like the people around them are not going to attack them, uh, when they feel like they're not going to be under the gun in some way. And so the, um, a, a workshop classroom tries to be a place that's a community where people believe that they can be supported by others. Um, also, they believe that the, the community, this idea of community is important because the, um, you want to feel as a writer like there are people waiting to hear what you've got to say. Uh, it's important that you uh, believe that there are others out there listening so that you can find a voice. And that's the kind of environment that we try to create for kids. And, and, and teachers work really hard on, uh, on trying to create that kind of environment for kids. Well, and I like your notion of the dialogic approach. 
that there was a conversation back and forth between teacher and students and students and other students and students and other people in the community. Yeah. Yeah, they, it, it, learning is a dialogue. I mean, you, we, we learn, we know what we know uh, because we're getting ready to say it to somebody. Um, you know how a lot of the time, most of us go through the day, and a lot of the time we're rehearsing conversations that we think we might have. In a way, that's what our thinking is, is uh, imagining our way into conversations we might have or imagining revisions of conversations we did have. I wish I'd said that. <laughs> uh, and so we, we're trying to, um, uh, we, we think with others in our minds. And the, um, the, uh, so this, this idea of dialogue between uh, teachers and kids, kids and kids, kids in their world is, um, really tries to capture, capture accurately the nature of thinking. Um, and, uh, and so that means in order to, be, to, to invite kids into a dialogue, we have to help them become responsive, um, help them to feel like they can tune into their own thoughts after listening to somebody else's thoughts. They learn how to really listen to somebody else. They learn how to really read something and really take in what the author was saying that was not already in their mind. And then, how to, then they make an answer to that. They make a response. Um, and tuning into your own thoughts in response to those of others is, um, is the basis of thinking. And yet, in schools, to, so much of the time, when kids pay attention to their own thoughts, we say their mind's wandering. We say they're, they're not with us because they're paying attention to their own thoughts. That's a bad thing. Um, but in a, in, a, in a process classroom or a workshop classroom, that, that's, that's what we were aiming for. Well, that was one of the things that fascinated me about the approach is the idea of working to empower students. And I think that's behind the whole thing is listening to them, working with them to help overcome the silencing. Right. It's, it, it's an effort to empower them in, in deep ways. Now, that, does, that doesn't mean that the kids, that, it, that an individual's ego or that an individual's uh, willfulness overpowers everything in their environment, because uh, so, that wouldn't be a dialogue either. Um, so empowerment isn't sort of the amplification of the self, you know, like making the kid as huge as they can uh, become. It's, uh, it's really uh, empowering them to really be able to see and, and notice one another, uh, to really take in what's going on in the world around them, um, and, uh, and helping them to be able to uh, res uh, respond to works of literature uh, in ways that, uh, that are meaningful. Well, I found it also interesting that it was looking at their own lived experience which they have some. And then the teacher is honoring the language of the students' everyday lives. So looking at that and pulling out things, you don't have to look way over to some other country, it's right there. Right, in very practical terms, in very practical terms, that means that uh, though kids will read literatures of other countries, though they'll read literatures of, of, of great traditions in, 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 uh, uh, in the world, we will also value as literature the stories that bring, the kids bring in with them. Hello, this is Jim Schaefer, executive producer and host of Rip Rap, the academic book television program. My guest today is Rebecca Bowers Seip, who will discuss her book, They Still Can't Spell, Understanding and Supporting Challenged Spellers in Middle and High School. Welcome to Rip Rap. Thank you. This is a really interesting book. Um, I think it's wonderful because it takes the whole process of learning how to spell out of some kind of dark ages and brings it into a much more comfortable yet competent place in a learning environment. How and why did you and your co-authors, Don Putman, Karen Reed Nordwall, Tracy Rosewain, and Jennifer Walsh, embark on this journey of discovery about spelling, a topic that so many, including students, insist is so important but who also feel sometimes so helpless in figuring out ways to do it accurately and a topic that too often s becomes overwhelmed even as the size of the challenge is underestimated. Well, Jim, this book has been a long time in the process for me. Um, by the time I came to Michigan and started teaching at Eastern Michigan University, I'd been working with public schools for 25 years. And of course, across that 25 years, I have worked with so many kids who've had difficulty with spelling. And then I had children of my own, both of whom are quite bright. Uh, my daughter's in grad school, my son's in college, but as I watched them come along, I watched each of them have different levels of, of problems with spelling. Uh, my daughter seemed to adapt 
to the difficulty she was having fairly easily, came up with lots of strategies. My son was not nearly so successful in doing so. So by the time I uh, connected with Don and Tracy and Karen and Jennifer, I had lots and lots of questions about spelling. Um, each of them are classroom teachers. At the time we started our teacher research project, Tracy was uh, teaching at, in Pinckney, Alaska at the high school level. Uh, Don was at Chelsea in the high school. Karen was in Livonia at the middle school and Jennifer was at Forsyth Middle School in Ann Arbor. So we had quite a spread of, of talents and, and interest and all coming together with questions about what's going on with spelling in our classrooms, particularly from the vantage point of as secondary and college teachers, what can we do now? I mean, is there anything that we could realistically do now to support um, these struggling spellers? And I also want to just point out that all of us are members of, of the National Writing Project. We've all been through um, multi-week summer invitational institutes. Mine years and years ago, I've directed writing projects for a long time. So we all came to this question with a really clear sense that spelling is a very small part of the overall writing process. Um, but what we had noticed is that for some of our students, even though we thought spelling was a small thing, and we could say, oh, don't worry about your spelling until we get to the final draft, you know, we'll take care of it in the final draft. For some of our students, spelling seemed to be a big enough obstacle that it actually appeared to be interfering with both their ability to write and their, their motivation to engage in writing. So it was taking on proportions that were far bigger than we thought it warranted. That's what I noticed, and I've noticed from my own teaching, is that the student's self-esteem gets mm -hmm. all tangled up mm -hmm. with it, and they really feel like if they can't spell that they're terribly deficient. Mm -hmm. Well, in our society, we have set things up to make people feel that there's something really wrong with them if they can't spell. Uh, in one study, uh, uh, it was, um, it was uh, highlighted that at least one out of five Americans are what they called closet poor spellers. I mean, some people will avoid writing altogether so that people won't know that they're, they're challenged spellers or poor spellers. They've internalized that to mean that if I can't spell, there's something wrong with my brain. If I can't spell, then I'm not as smart as somebody else. If I can't spell, well, obviously I can't write. And all of those are um, fallacies about spelling. Um, we, we, we can get into that in a lot of detail, but we know that there's no correlation between poor spelling and intellectual capability. Two of the people that I included just as sort of a control in the study were college professors, multiply published, very renowned people, one in linguistics, one in literature. Obviously, the fact that they had difficulty spelling wasn't something that was even a career um, liability for them. But the question is, why is that the case for some people and for other people who have the same kind of difficulty? There seems to be a huge stumbling block. Well, one of the things I really enjoyed was how you started trying to define what the problem is or what the nature of the mm -hmm. situation is. Maybe you can talk a little bit about that because you really get into a more fine-tuned appreciation. Sure. Um, the research started out with, as I said, four classrooms and then my classroom and some collegial interviews um, in addition to that. And what we did is we tried to take a look at people who were both self-identified and teacher-identified as challenge spellers. We collected data in lots of different ways. We had the students do first draft writing, talking about their own history as a speller. We looked at their final draft writing with an eye toward, well, what are they able to self-correct? We did spelling placement inventories uh, using Richard Gentry's inventory that's this very normed and, and widely accepted in the field. We did in-depth interviews. Both the teacher did interviews and I did interviews of the, with the students to, to get some uh, deeper textured looks at their um, spelling instructional history uh, and other kinds of factors that might have influenced where they are as spellers. Oh, let's see, we did a visual memory, um, uh, a normed, nationally normed visual memory inventory to look at both short-term visual memory and long-term visual memory and just lots of other kinds of things. So we had lots and lots and lots of data to take a look at. Um, are you interested in some of the things? Oh, absolutely. That, okay. the, the next question would be, what kind of patterns did you well, see? Well, we found just, I'll get lost in this. We found lots of different things. First of all, we found that 
um, for most of the challenge spellers, just in terms of the placement inventories. Most of them were very successful with the inventories up until about grade four, three, four. Mm -hmm. But definitely by grade four, they started experiencing difficulty. Uh, on these inventories, when we hit a 50% um, misspell rate, that would sort of be the, the top out in terms of proficiency. Um, and if you start taking that backwards, you start looking at what that means. In traditional spelling uh, instruction, we rely on initially on, on sound letter relationship. And so phonics plays a huge part up until about grade two, going in between two and three. So we're very sound based. At about two, three, we start making a shift to looking at visual cues for spelling. How did it look when you saw it in print? You know, how did it look the last time you, 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 read, you wrote the word? Um, and then at about fourth grade, we start making another shift into meaning-based strategies. Can you break the word apart? Does it have a prefix, a suffix? Is there a root? Is there a rule that kind of governs that? Uh, so, so that's the traditional history. All the students, every single student in our study had a traditional spelling background. They could all recall list. They all had the notion that the list may have had some sort of uh, generalization, but they didn't know what that was. They all talked about uh, out-of-school support for spelling. It's often a mom, a dad, a grandma uh, who would drill them on the words. They would have words on Mondays, generally with a pretest, exercises Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, final test on Friday. They even talked about the words being posted on the refrigerator door. Yeah. I mean, it's the, it was like my background all over again. I mean, I, so I could really understand the kind of background that they had had. So when they started washing out on this test at about grade four, what that suggested to me is that they had had a really thorough background in phonics. But as you know, English is not a language that is consistently um, based on English phonetic structure. We invite words from all over the place. And so at about the point where we shift to, uh, shifted to visual-based cues, something happened. So the next thing that suggested to me was, well, let's check visual memory. And not, not surprisingly, every single individual had some degree of difficulty with visual memory, most often more difficulty with long-term visual memory. We hope you enjoy viewing those interviews with three scholars who have much to say about writing. Thank you for tuning in, Rip Rap.